I'll give like a little bit more in-depth introduction, I guess. Um, Sydney James, I enrolled member of the uh, Ogallala Sioux. Um, I did my undergrad, I, took, I went to two different schools, went to South Coast School of Mines and Technology, so it's out in Rapid City. Um, and I was studying civil engineering out there. I was out there for three and a half years, and then I transferred to UNL, and then I finished up my bachelor's out here in civil engineering. I graduated in May, and then um, I was always going to go to law school, but Dr. Eilet was in my ear during the uh, the summer academy, uh, you know, a year ago, and uh, he's like, you know, so if you go to Matsy, we'll you know, we'll pay for your master's. And so, you know, money talks. And so I, uh, <laughs> I ended up, you know, so I'm now a master's student uh, with Mid America Transportation Center. So that's why I get to do all this cool stuff with you guys all the time. Um, and so I'm doing my research is on transportation safety uh, during extreme events. So that'll be like flooding, or if we have like hazardous uh, material spill, like on the railroad tracks that go through like Walt Hill and uh, Winnebago. And so it's um, focusing on rural and tribal areas so that, you know, if something bad happens, what do we do? Because those areas are kind of underserved and underprepared. Um, but it has some unique challenges, too, to go with them. You know, so just trying to get community involvement, community engagement on the, in the um, tribal areas. It's kind of like how Tammy talked last night. Like, I'm not going to come in and be like, all right, solve your problem. You know, I want to hear from the people that live there, you know, what's going to work for you? What do you, how do you, you know, how, what's the best way to go about this? And so that's kind of what uh, my research focuses on. Um, that's what I got going on. I'm also the only non-PhD on this panel, <laughs> There's a joke behind that one. So. <laughs> and I'm uh, Gabe. I've been working with uh, you know you guys for the time being, but I can tell a little bit uh, more of my background too. So I, um, you know, I, I was born in Vermilion, South Dakota, but I was uh, I grew up in Sisseton, South Dakota, and I graduated from high school from Sisseton. So I. You know, like I'm, I'm up here. I, I did just recently get my doctorate, but it was a long, kind of different path, and you know that that's been kind of the theme. Uh, when I graduated from high school, the first place I went to was a private liberal arts college called Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. And I'll give, I'll, I'll find some prize before the end of the day if somebody can guess what my first major was. So just throw out some liberal arts. <laughs> More specifically, art. It was, yeah. <laughs> no, I really didn't. <laughs> I started out my college career uh, many, many years ago as a studio arts major, like a you know, like graphic art major and stuff like that. And you know, then I, because I, I liked art or high school and everything. Uh, but then I got to college and I kind of realized that I didn't really want to do that. So I started also thinking about other things that were important to me. Um, and one of those is that um, my dad was a PhD in history. He was a first generation college student um, and he worked really hard uh, after going to the Vietnam War, got his degree, um, basically had to kind of give up living with his family to study in graduate school and, and so for him, it was a huge accomplishment to finally become a, a doctor. And for him, he was like 50 years old when he earned his degree. So, um, you know, it was a very good achievement. And so I was hooked up to that. I thought that was a, so cool. So I was always thinking about like higher education and stuff like that. So I went from studio art to art education. And then that's kind of what I was thinking about doing. Um, and this is, I'm still in Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, and I didn't really like it that much. And so I was thinking about transferring down to the University of South Dakota, town of Vermilion, uh, at that point. And then uh, an opportunity arose where I could go and study for a semester in Mexico. And so the choice was between studying in South Dakota or going to Mexico. Uh, and so I went to Mexico, and I ended up at this really uh, cool uh, college called uh, the University of the Americas in Spanish. It's La Universidad de las Americas in Pueblo, Mexico. Um, and I just ended up there. My plan was to do uh, a year for like a semester abroad and then go back to South Dakota and then study. I don't know what I was going to say at that point. Um, but I got interested in... Um, international relations. 
And so I went from art education to international relations. And then at that point, I was like, you know what? I want to get a PhD. And so uh, about 21, I was like, I'm going to get a PhD in international relations. And so I was studying international relations. I got through a couple courses that were interesting. And then I realized that international relations it's, it is interesting. I'm not denigrating the nature at all, but it was. It's a lot of. Um, it, it it was something that was for a career path that I wasn't necessarily interested in, and that's working in politics. Like I don't have any interest in, you know, being a politician or anything like that. Um, and a lot of the people that study international relations are very political, and I'm not very political, and so I didn't really fit in there, but I did kind of find a niche in that I like international relations theory, and that's how I got introduced to philosophy, is because I was reading an article in international relations theory one day in the library, and then it was talking about philosophy, and so I started to look at the uh, bibliography that was on the article, and um, really interesting stuff, so I found those items in the library, I started reading them. And so midway through the international relations degree, I was like, I want to study philosophy. But I finished out the degree in international relations. Um, and this is still in Mexico, too, by the way. I didn't, I didn't end up going home through some, um, well, through the relationship that my dad had with the woman that I was staying with. I was able to stay down in Mexico and, um, and live down there while I was studying in Mexico. So that, kind of worked out that's like, oh, I don't know if anybody else on the panel is going to talk about just these little little lucky occurrences, but that was a little lucky occurrence for me. I just met the right person and um, got, managed to stay down, have a place to stay in Mexico um, while I studied. And then, um, so I was studying um, international relations, but philosophy on the side, and I started looking into going to graduate school in philosophy. And I didn't really want to pursue graduate study in Mexico due to, um, due to the sort of type of philosophy that uh, people down there were interested in. So my goal was a US graduate program uh, in philosophy. Um, and you don't, graduate school in philosophy is very competitive. There are very few spots um, that are open for funded opportunities. And by funded opportunities, I mean like what Chris was talking about yesterday with uh, being a graduate teaching assistant and uh, having a um, tuition remission. So basically, they pay you to go to school, but maybe, I don't know if you mentioned this, but they pay you and you like teach classes and any do or you assist professors and stuff like that. Yeah, it's diff diff different in every discipline. It, yeah, it's different. And in, 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 in philosophy, you like you actually work for the department. So I taught, um, um, well, that's kind of jumping ahead and sort. So <laughs> in order to get some of those funding spots, you actually have to have a degree in philosophy. So the next step um, from international relations to graduate school in philosophy was another undergraduate degree. So I moved from Mexico, like Pueblo, Mexico, way up to Moorhead, or no, Morris, Minnesota at this time, um, to the University of Minnesota Morris, which is actually a great place that you should all look into because uh, Native Americans get tuition um, remission there. So, uh, you know, you still have to pay for room and board, but again, if you qualify for a Pell Grant, you can get Pell, you can get work study. There's ways to address the costs that are associated. But I mean, it's living in Morris, Minnesota. You can rent a place. I rented a place because it was uh, income adjusted for $25 a month. So it's very cheap to live there, and you get your tuition paid for. And it's a University of Minnesota degree. So that's my plug for you at Morris. Um, so I lucked out because when I went to Morris, since I had the degree already in international relations, I was able to not have to take general courses or anything like that and just focus on the classes I needed to get a bachelor's of arts in philosophy. So I was just taking philosophy classes and I was focusing on my graduate uh, applications. And so that's what I did for a couple years and I ended up here at UNL. So um, 
Um, let's see. Then, oh yeah, so I got to UNL, and, and throughout this whole part, I was thinking, well, I'm going to be a professor, I'm going to be a professor. And then I got through um, a couple years of graduate school, and then I realized what the academic market is for philosophy graduates. And it is a grim, bleak, depressing place. There are, in the United States, every year, uh, hundreds, I think, yeah, hundreds of graduates competing for like jobs in the teens. So there, there are very few jobs, but a lot of people um, competing for them. And so a lot of people that do graduate with uh, philosophy PhDs from a program like Nebraska um, end up doing uh, work that isn't very um, appeal that not very appealing. So adjunct professoring at um, like community colleges, basically teaching eight classes a semester. Um, you don't have time for uh, personal life. You don't have time for your research. You don't have time for a lot of things, and the compensation is all often very hard to get by on. So there's stories about people who are philosophy, and not just philosophy, it could be through other humanities disciplines who are basically like PhD people on welfare, living in their cars. And that, to me, that just didn't really, um, you know, I was, I was giving a look at my realistic, a realistic look at my prospects, and that didn't really um, appeal to me. And at the same time, I was also teaching for an excellent program on campus called the WH Thompson Scholars Program. So, the scholar, the Thompson Program, is um, is a is a special group uh, within the UNL system that offers really specialized uh, attention to. Um, first-generation students, um, students from low-income uh, families and situations, and, um, and that. So they're smaller class sizes, and I learned about the program. So I, I realized at that point that I was more interested in doing uh, educational outreach. And so, like um, I mentioned before about like chance occurrences, it was around that time that I met G. Gosh, Gosh, you know, that spoke to us the other night at the um, at Lazlo's, yeah. And um, you know, like Judy said, she said I didn't tell the whole story. That's correct. I didn't tell the whole story. <laughs> she was she had met Larry, and Larry had mentioned the job, and then Judy said, "Well, I know this guy Abe." So I was in, um, boy, where was I? I, I was on vacation. And I get this email from Judy, and she's like, hey, Abe, I think you should really meet this, uh, this guy, Larry. Um, he might have a job opportunity available to you. And, and so I was like, OK, cool. That sounds good, because um, at that point, I was thinking, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I was, I was done with my coursework. I was just starting on my dissertation. And I just kind of had this um, like situation in front of me that was kind of um, I don't know, it was less than encouraging. I, it was a little bleak at that point. And then I went and talked to Larry, and then a couple weeks later, or about a week later, I had another interview at uh, Matsy, and I got hired as the educated. Well, at that point, I was the just the education coordinator. And then I just worked my way through up there. And at the same time, I was working on my dissertation. So I finished the dissertation, and I've got an opportunity to um, you know, we keep working at the center. And we've grown the outreach programs that we do. This is one of them. So I'm so glad to have all of you here. Um, and yeah, that's so like I said, um, started off way, <laughs> way, way, way different than I ended up. And it's just, yeah, everyone's journey is a little bit different. So yeah. I'm going to keep you. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll keep mine short. I went to school. <laughs> so my background is also untraditional in the sense I started junior college. It was a liberal arts school. I went through the Army uh, to help pay for school. And then I went to Montana State University, where I got a little bit braver. And I went into industry. Wanted to be, wanted to do more. Actually, the thing that made me wanted to do more was I was working at 3M, and the things that I wanted to do 
everyone told me I couldn't do because I didn't have experience and I didn't have a PhD, which I'll now make a joke about. So there, I'll give you the clean version of the joke. So you know what it, the difference between a, a BS degree, an MS degree, and a PhD is. It's a joke, so we can laugh. So when you finish your bachelor's of science degree, you will learn a lot, I guarantee you. Whatever discipline you choose, you will learn a lot, and you'll think, oh, I know a lot. And then you go to math, you get your master's, and you start learning the theory of what you just did. And then you realize, I don't know anything. <laughs> Everything I learned were approximations of theory of some sort. So I really know nothing. Yeah. I am dumb. And then you get your PhD, and you realize, I don't know anything. But no one knows I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, I, you know, my transition has been through here, and you've heard a couple things that inspired me, which is I used to train people that were PhDs, and I tried to help them, and I really saw a difference in terms of, you know, the people that came to me were Americans, they were domestic students, and the people that knew a lot were people from other countries. And I just did not understand how we as a country could send our people to the moon and then now they don't know anything. And so when I see us as a whole, right, the potential that you have, you have not been able to capitalize on it because I think of this like a diet, right? You've been starved and what you're able to do, you've been given hamburgers all the time. Or, right? or just rice all the time. So your ability to do things has been limited by those who taught you and those that inspired you and those that tried to push you along a little bit further. And so there's not many of us that are there to be able to try to do that for you and push you. So my job is to be pushy. And I try to do that a little bit. And we'll keep them. <laughs> I'm going to turn over to you. <laughs> well, to keep it this good, so you know, let's go. <laughs> uh, thank you. So my name is Regina Iloate. Um, I got to share with you all a bit about my academic journey. So I think I'll share some of those, what uh, Gabe referred to as kind of chance occurrences or uh, relatedness, I would say, in interesting ways that just evolve into paths, you know, that connect to something else. And then what's sustained beyond that? Um, and I would say getting back to inspirations that truly working with Native students is, is a huge inspiration to me. Um, and I would, so I would say it's the youth and then it's the elders that inspire me as well and in my family and my ancestors and learning about you know what, what they've lived through and what they've learned and what they know and don't know. <laughs> I know nothing. And that's inspiring to know nothing too because you know, then you're free to ask questions and, and keep asking questions, and that's very liberating, you know, to be able to be. I always, I always feel like the kindergartner in the room, you know, and that's good because I'm still open to learning so much, and that's fun. Um, so you all know that I, I grew up. Um, well, I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation, but I grew up in Southern California. My family moved out to California to follow uh, Will Rogers. Actually, they were close. It's my only claim to fame. <laughs> Um, and so my great-grandmother moved out um, to Santa Monica, but I grew up in San Diego, so my, then my grandmother moved down to San Diego. Um, and I ended up going to school in Arizona, my parents were divorced, and I had lived with, grew up with my dad, and then moved to Arizona for a while, and um, got in the school system there, and they gave Regents scholarships to students that did well academically, so I had kind of like a full ride. It paid my tuition to go to ASU. So I had that option. Then I had lots of other options, you know, like the California school system or other schools that I was interested in. Um, but I chose the one that wasn't going to cost me money because I didn't have that. So I went to ASU. Um, and there, I, they had a very strong Native um, student group, support group, and they also had um, scholarship advisors for Native students, which was an incredible support. And I, I encourage you to look into that too. Um, and ended up um, 
studying abroad for a semester in Spain and learning Spanish. <laughs> now I'm very combative. <laughs> um, it was, and then, and that was actually I just studied culture and culture shock, um, and I, I ended up writing a master, uh, sorry, undergraduate thesis because I was in the honors college, so I had to write a thesis. So I did that um, on culture shock um, from Spanish and uh, the United States, and on a poet that wrote about that. And my professor asked me at that time, he said, well, are you going to come back? You want to come back and get a master's in Spanish? <laughs> and I literally kind of laughed and thought, well, there's, I had never thought about graduate school, ever. If he had not asked me that, I would not be right here today. I mean, honestly, I, it was not on my radar. I never thought I was capable of graduate school. It wasn't something I even thought about. It was like, get through college, you know? And even with, like, doing well in college, and I got good grades, and I studied a lot. I worked really hard. I'm not one of those people that, it comes easy to. I work really, really hard, um, and and still like study very hard and read a lot, and I'm slow, and so it takes it takes a lot. But I give it that. So nothing has been that easy. But but so then I thought, well, oh my gosh, he believes in me. You know, maybe I could. And I hadn't thought about that. And, and I really loved learning the language. And I thought, well, that's interesting because it's language and culture and. I mean, as much as I would love to go learn our Cherokee language and culture, I wasn't ready to move that far away from my family. Um, so I did it. And then that then led to other things where I um, told you all that I had a lot of anxiety and stress in college. And, and I learned different things that helped keep me healthy in that environment. And one of those was, was practicing yoga. Um, so I did yoga teacher training. And then through that, I realized, well, I really want to study wellness because that's what that helped me with is spiritual wellness because for me it was like a space to really spend time with the creator um, and and experience things on a physical mental spiritual level that practice so i was actually creating a program of study to go to prescott college in arizona in their sustainability education program but i found out they wouldn't fund i mean i got accepted but then they wouldn't fund me <laughs> and my brother taught me well. He said, don't go. If they don't have a job for you and they can't pay for it, don't take out the loans and go into debt. And I listened to him because he did that. He's still paying off his loans. So I listened and I thought, well, maybe I'll just, I was teaching school at the time I was teaching junior high. And I thought, well, there was this program that I was using a lot of their information from because at Prescott College you had to write your own courses. It was interesting. It was like a a distance learning thing and you had to choose your textbooks so when you applied you wrote your program of study like what you were going to study you made up your classes you made up this your textbooks and stuff so while i was writing that i was using resources from creighton i had never even heard of creighton before nebraska was not on my radar at all but i was like well they have all these classes i'm really interested in and it was christian spirituality classes and they they offered a lot of courses that i thought well you know what if they're offering this, why don't I just go? So I looked into it, and I ended up coming here for the summer. So it was like I could teach all year, and I could save up money to pay for that. And then I came to Omaha for the summer for three summers to do that master's in Christian spirituality. And while I was here in Omaha, well, here a little ways away, I was working in the community gardens, and I met professors in public health. And that's how I ended up in public health, because they were like, oh, how did you get here? And so I started telling them, and they said, oh, well, we have a program, you know, that you might be interested in if you want to do a PhD still. And I said, well, that sounds interesting, and looked into it, and then I ended up moving back full time and doing and pursuing that. So I studied preventive and societal medicine, but my research was all on spiritual wellness, and they let me do that which was amazing. So those little chances, and you just never know who you're going to meet. You know, I met, it was a dean of research for the College of Public Health who was just happened to be working in the garden, you know? The one professor who just asked, all he did was ask me, do you, do you want to come back for, for a master's? Do you, do you want to go to graduate school? These things, you know, changed my life, really. Um, and then I think that along the way, the things that I did to try to help sustain that came from from learning, you know, how to support myself too. So I had to, I was in school, but I worked the whole way through. So I had graduate assistantship 
when I was at Arizona State, and then um, at Creighton I was working, but just coming in the summer so I could pay, save up and pay for it when I came out here. And then when I was at UNMC, I worked full time, which is what Aislinn's doing. She's not still in here, but I worked full time. So that if you work for a university, then they will give you, like they'll pay, cover your tuition costs. So that's what I did, I worked. And the, the good thing about that was that I got a lot of experience. So when I graduated, like Gabe knows, you come out, you don't just have that degree saying you know nothing, <laughs> but you also have some experience that helped pay your way through that. So that really helped me a lot, um, all the way through. And prayer, prayer, you know. So that's, that's, those are my chance stories, is it? Is there anything else we have to handle or are we supposed to talk about other things? Well, we're, we're, are, do you guys have any questions? What, what questions are remaining? Because I know we're, we're coming to, towards the end of that program, so. Oh, what did you guys learn from us? I see you as raw material. <laughs> if, you understand what, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I hope you and the reason I said is because, you know, this, I, I remember when I went to Eastern Montana College, and it was a liberal arts college, it was small, it was less than a thousand people, and it was comfortable to me to go there, right? And I told you a little bit about myself in the sense that, you know, there was only two Native American families in the high school I went to, and if you looked at all the Native American families in the three public high schools that were in Billings, Montana, of 75,000 people, there was probably five of us. That was it. And you can imagine how difficult that was. I mean, when I was at Montana State, I remember enrolling. In, um, well, first, I'll start Eastern. Um, when I was Eastern, I had two kids when I went there. And there was this one Native American woman that was in the help center. And she saw that I was interested in more than just um, going into Native American studies. Because that's what most people want to do, because it's comfortable, right? It's history. It's important, right? But she saw that I was different. And so she saw something that I didn't see. And so she really tried to push me. Uh, and I was a very stubborn person <laughs> that had opinions, <laughs> even at that age. So, you know, I got married when I was 18 in high school. And I had a kid when I was in high school. So there is no excuse that you can throw at me that I'm, not, I'm gonna say that you can stand up and stand there and say that this is why I can't do it. There is none. You have two hands, you have two feet, you have two eyes, and you're here. So there is no excuse in my mind. So I lived through that, and somebody helped me. Somebody's always going to help you. You have to be willing to receive. So I did, and she talked me into doing something that was scary to me. She said, go to Montana State University. They have this summer program, and it'll be good, they're doing science and they're gonna help you become a medical doctor, you know, this is where they wanted you to go. And I really wasn't interested in being a medical doctor. I thought about the time frame of doing that. I had two kids by then and it's like, that's 12 years, I'm not gonna waste no 12 years. It's like, that's a long, that's a lifetime, I can't do that. It's like going K through 12 again, I'm not doing that, <laughs> right, it's insane. <laughs> so, you know, they talked me to doing this, I went there and, you know, they, they found some housing for me. It was cheap, and you know, they, they kind of put some things in place. The next thing, I'm, I'm slicing rat brains. Like, I don't care about rat brains. I'm slicing this stuff with a microtome and floating on the glass slides so some graduate student can look at what happens to a rat if I put something on it and make it mad. It's like, okay, that's not exciting. I don't need to see the science. But anyhow, that's what they were doing. And I was, I got good at slicing rat brains. Anyhow, so when I was done, there was someone else that talked to me about applying for some scholarships, but first it was ACES. And then what I found was, next thing I know, it's like I kept getting, not medical degree, kind of medical school type, type of scholarships were, were quite prevalent now, but it was, it was always science, like Dow Chemical, engineering, something. It was like always science-based, and the next thing I know, it's like, well, okay, I'm going to be a chemical engineer, because I didn't know what else there was, because growing up in Billings, Montana, we had three refineries and there were chemical engineers though there, and I knew that they made money. It's like, I need money to help pay for my family, to take care of them, to help them. And I knew that was a degree, I didn't know what it was. And so I did that, and I remember my first experience when I went there, they wanted to, because it's all white, you know, everyone there was white. Well, it's, uh, 
modern romantic, which is that word. But anyhow, they were all the same. And they said to me, I remember admitting this professor, he said to me, you know, we've never had anyone like you make it through here before. That's what he had said to me. I was like, now, you know, I had just been come out of the army by then. So I had to have, you know, I was going to say something about a little, still a little bit uncomfortable doing that. But that's what was told me. Uh, but along that, you know, I, I, you know, no student wanted to study with me because I wasn't white. Uh, but I found that, you know, I could make the professors be my person to study with. I could study in advance and make them answer my questions. And I figured that out. And I made them do that because they're there and they have to be there. And by God, I don't care what they say to me. They're going to do what I want them to do and help me. And that's what I made them do. And along the way, you know, this one person stuck in my head. Actually, there was two people stuck in my head. They said to me things like, you know, Chris, you're not Swiss cheese. You know, I was, what does he mean by that? He said, you have far more potential than you think. Because at that point, you know, I never knew. I had no moral model other than, you know, this is me fighting the system. And, you know, and I had another professor I worked for in their organic chemistry lab. And he said, Chris, you're extremely talented. He said, my graduate student can't even do what you do. You know, you just can walk in and you have the aptitude for this. You need to go to, you need to get your PhD. So they stuck that in my head and it stuck with me. You know, and I started working in the industry and I was always dissatisfied. So I brought you back to the 3M thing where they were saying, you don't have a PhD. You can't do this work. And so I, I was a little upset you know, because I had, I remember this too vividly. This one guy just finished his PhD from Notre Dame, Catalysis this area, Ivy Lake School. He's supposed to be smart. And he's supposed to help us with this area. That's why I told you, finish your PhD, you think you know a lot. Anyhow, so he came in, he's trying to help us. He's like, this guy knows nothing. How dare he try to lead and tell me what to do and run this thing? And the only thing that's keeping me from being able to do what I need to do is a stupid PhD. And I know I can do it. By then, I had built enough confidence in there. So I went back. My wife set certain rules for going because at that time, I had three children. I was pregnant. And we were about to have our fourth one. And so when I left, my wife said, so I went and looked at all these schools. And I got into the University of Michigan, and Virginia Tech, and other places. And I hopped on a plane because my wife said, I don't want to live in a big city, and I don't want this, and I don't want it too cold. And it's like, I feel like the Goldilocks and Three Bears. It's like, right? It's like, it's like, Come on, throw me a bone here. So anyhow, I, I remember flying to Virginia, uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, meeting someone there, and you know, he said, okay, you can rent this house. So I found a house, I found everything. And so we just I packed up the moving truck and moved us there. My son was two months old. And, and you know, that changed the path for everything. I mean, every time you make a decision, it changes a path for you. It changes everything like I was talking to Ruth about. There are some there is always someone there that will want to help you. There are always opportunities for you. It's a question of as this raw material that I'm telling you that you are, are you willing to receive it? Are you open to receive it, right? There's always times in our life where someone tells us something, right? We're, we just don't listen. We're just not ready yet to hear it. So we're hoping, we're trying to make you ready to hear it, right? You're right, your point right now because you've heard something that's got you here, right? Now are you willing to go another one, another step? That's the question. I might have to get in by hearing you out. <laughs> I'm about to pull up my drill sergeant stuff. <laughs> Drop! <laughs> Sean I'll grass roll you. <laughs> Sean Wilson, who he, he wrote the book Research is Ceremony and does a lot of work in indigenous research, and he says, he says knowledge, knowledge actually has agency, and that if knowledge makes choices, on when to be shared with us, you know, when we're open to it, when we're, we're ready to hear it. And, and the knowledge chooses when to present itself to us. So it is, it's, it's like we're in relationship with that knowledge, right? Of what that next step is or what, where we go or how we do it. And I, yeah, I think sometimes we're, we're 
drawn towards that, and and then other times we're really seeking it out and looking for it. You know, like the the chance things that have happened to me sometimes were just chance, and somehow being in that place at that time and in relationship with that person or that place. Then there's other things I could think of, like I had an incredible, and she's still. I mean, I have, I have an incredible teacher. Her name is Dr. Michelle DeMarie. She's Métis and teaches in Native American Studies at UNO. And she served on my committee while I was at the Med Center. Um, but I took a ton of classes at UNO, and they, I studied Native American Studies while I studied medical sciences at the same time because I was seeking that out. I wanted that. And so that was me going after that, right? And, and I ended up have, building it incredibly wonderful, beautiful, supportive relationship with my teacher. Um, and when I, when you ask what do we learn from you, I, I, that's what I see. You know, I see reinforcement. I learned that I need to keep doing what I'm doing no matter how discouraging it can get at times. Um, because this, that, that, that hopefully I can someday be a little bit of what my teacher was for me. For, for you, you know, for all of you. And when I hear what you're interested in, I hear that there's, I hear that you are open, like Chris is saying, you're open to that knowledge. I hear a lot of, of good work coming, you know, in, in construction. I hear public health, because that's where I come from. Like, all of it's public health. Like, I can see construction fitting into public health in our environment, you know. And every bit of this relates to our public health and wellness, but I mean, even when you shared with me, you know, one of my practices that's grounding is, is um, morning prayer into the sunrise, right? So for me, that that was, a, that was a gift. I've been working with contemplative practices for a long time and really feeling like, I was going to share that with you, the handout, the um, Center for Mind and Life Society has this tree of contemplative practices, and I think those are so much more meaningful and powerful when they're rooted in our traditions and in our culture. And I would love someday to work with people to do one of those for um, different, like Native cultures or Indigenous culture overall, to do a tree of contemplative practices so that we have that there as a resource. So what you shared with me, Casey, was 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 knowledge about that. You know, this is, you shared your experience. When you all share with me where you're from, who you are, we learn from that. You know, it's, it's inspiring to us, really, as teachers and, and as students. What are the chances you see that of oh, any of us coming back in the future? Coming back to? To go to school here. Oh, I see all the chance in the world. Oh. It's, 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 but the question is, so it doesn't even have to be here, right? Yeah. The question is where, do, where does it work for you, right? So just like maybe for someone else, you know, praying it, praying into sunrise isn't there, isn't the way that they do it, right? But what's the right fit for you? But but I see all of you looking for that, open to that, um, asking questions, hearing us, and and gathering more information to make those decisions about what's right for you. But I I can see a sense of belonging here for any one of you, definitely. I mean, you know people here now. Well, the reason why I said that is because anything's possible. Yes. Did anyone ever see that movie, What About Bob? Yes. <laughs> so I see you as baby steps. <laughs> baby step out of the door. Baby step down the hall. Baby step all the way here. Right? For those that have not seen it, go see it because it's funny. Mm -hmm. It is funny. <laughs> it's funny, right? Yeah, if I don't see you here next <laughs> next fall, I'll be knocking on your door. I'm going to talk to your mom. I'll be like, what's going on? Yeah. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> see, that's why you're afraid, because now you're accountable. <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun to have support, right? I, I mean, I've seen quite a bit of change. Um, the fact that there's so many of you here now is a signal of that. Um, I used to serve on the engineering advisory board to Montana State. And I can tell you when I was there, how many natives were there. And then when I came back and gave a talk to the ACES chapter, I was amazed. You know, there is at least 30 natives that were in STEM fields. Some, you know, they're doing that because they want to go to medical school, but that was just blew my mind. Like, how did that happen? That is amazing. So many people there. And before, there's three of us. Going, you know, order of magnitude change in the number of people there. Highly driven people. 
right? Realizing that they should, they also have potential, right? You you have potential. Those are questions you want to find. Yeah. You want to take that raw ore and process it, just show what it can become. You know, all of us, you know, you can talk to your parents, they say the same thing, right? When my dad was in boarding school, right? he suffered. We all suffered, right? It's just that we have an opportunity to use that suffering as a way of sharing, to build, to grow, to change and transform. Which is fun, right? You get the right to stand and speak, help others. I like you on the smile. I like you on the smile. It's a copy. <laughs> What are your guys' <laughs> own goal strategy? Like, are they along, like, what, what are you, I think, right? Like, I mean, because that's what I was asking you, that's you, right, last, or a couple nights ago at dinner, how many people came last year? It sounds like they're about the same number, but, like, if, you know, if we can get just, like, more, more people that come to UNL and more people, you know, to realize that, you know, there's, you, you can do this, you know what I mean? There's no reason you can't, like, you know, like, the Summer Academy, um, I can't remember one of the kids that I was talking to. They're like, yeah, you know, um, I kind of thought before I'd just like get a job at the casino, but now I realize like, you know, I don't need to. I don't need to just go get a job at the casino because that's what my dad did or whatever. I can go to school and I can get off the res or I can go to school and I go back to the res. I can come back to the res and, you know, help out. I can do bigger things than just, you know, because like, there's nothing wrong with working at the casino. You know, you make money, whatever, but it's like, is it fulfilling to you? Is it is that what you want to do forever? It, you know what I mean? Like, kind of go back to Gabe's dissertation, right? Does it resonate with you? Does it give your life meaning at the end of the day? You're like, wow, I am really enjoying what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like, for me, like, engineering, solving those solving those puzzles, I can, like, you know, come home and, you know, tell my family, be like, oh, man, I had the best day. I figured it out. I did it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I put the pieces together and I, I really feel good about my end product, you know? And so that's kind of the goal, I think, for us is to, you know, get you guys feeling that way. So you guys have these, you know, careers, wherever it's in, and, you know, it's something that you're doing for the rest of your life that you come home at the end of the day and you're like, I did it. I, you know, I really had a great day. I really, like, felt good about what I was doing and I had a final product at the end that I want to share with people. And so you just kind of like that pride in your work or, you know, I helped someone today. I helped someone today and they're going to have a better day. You know, I I really mattered, you know. So, if, you know, that's kind of, I think, I think, you know, our goal, <laughs> our goal is to just get as many, you know, Native people feeling that way and just kind of break that cycle of, you know, ah, I'll, I'll just, you know, do nothing forever. I'll just, whatever, you know what I mean? And just like, I'll just be unhappy forever. You know, like we want, we want that. We want, we want good things for you and more of you, right? And so then you go back home and you say, oh man, I went to Lincoln and it was awesome. And so then, you know, next year your buddy comes or your nephew comes or, you know, whatever. And then they come and they experience it and they're like, wow, they were right. This, you know what I mean? There are more opportunities for me than what I see, you know, back home. And so just kind of making everyone realize, like you, what you said, Casey, like, I just didn't think it was possible. It's totally possible. Why wouldn't it be possible? You know what I mean? <coughs> and yeah, and also, I guess, um, relaying to you guys all the support that's out there, kind of like what Chris said, you know, like there are no excuses because there are people that will come up for you. You know, they will like support you. They will like, all right, what do you need? Do you need help studying? Do you need help finding life housing? Do you need scholarship? What do you need? Tell me and I know where to find it. I will tell you where to find it so that, you know, together we can get you here, we can get you successful. Like, you don't feel like you belong? Okay, here's the deal, we got ACES, we got, you know, we got Unite. We got people that are like you, that are already here, that you can learn from, that you can, you know, kind of have your little family here. Um, I mean, that's, that's how I got through my first three years at School of Mines. We had Tosh Bay, you know, we had extended family 
And so it's all the Native Americans that are studying engineering at school, <coughs> school and volunteering school. And so, oh man, I'm just really studying with, or I'm really struggling with calculus. Oh, I took calculus last year. What, what's up? What's your problem? You don't know how to derive? I'll teach you how to derive. And I'm really studying, I'm just really struggling with, you know, statics. Oh, I took statics three years ago. Let me help you. Let me help you. You know what I mean? Like, that stuff's out there. And yeah, kind of like what was said, like, asking for help and being willing to receive it. I guess those are kind of all our goals for you guys. It's just like, we want to present it to you so it's in your head, it's in your ear, right? So that you know, like, oh, I, I've been told how to handle this situation when I feel like this, you know? So, there you go. <laughs> There's uh, two people from Santee that graduated from here just recently. Oh, yeah? Mr. Thomas and uh, Tashina Denny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're kind of like my relatives. So uh, that's really inspiring, inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. How do you? How does it make you feel? It makes you feel like I can do it too. It's because they're really happy in the community. They do good things in the community. Mm -hmm. And now when I go back, I want to be more involved with them and ask them more questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I already do, but <laughs> yeah. But I want to ask more. Now. But now you know how to ask different questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, see that it's just two people that you know there's plenty of others still. Yeah, there's very doctor from there. Mary um uh, was the dean at one time. Oh yeah, yeah. She got her doctor here. I mean all in. I even though Christine's not an idiot, but she can talk to you about you and how she got her doctor right here. Oh, she wow. she speaks your language. I mean she even speaks the languages. More people than you. I mean, it's yeah, it's growing, it's growing. Mm -hmm. you know, so there are resources. You just have to be able to advocate for yourself and try and find. Them. Yeah, so I would just add something for what you know Gabe's saying. You know, he shared a really uh, good story about his life. Right, really, it was important talking about his path. And then you heard last night Tammy talking about you know her role and what she's been doing. And I, you know, I was listening to that and I thought, what we want is the same thing that she was saying you know, when she was visiting with you know different um, Native people and their places and help building buildings for them. And she visited with her colleagues in architecture, you know, that were non-Native. They said, you just want to build it so you have all the jobs. You know, that's what she was saying, all the work. And she said, that's not why. What we want is is be able to create a situation where you have a voice. And you can't have a voice unless you're in these roles here where now, instead of other people placing words and saying this is what you think, now you can actually have people that stop and reflect and then respond, right? In context to you and your community and what you need. Yeah. So whatever these roles are, right, that's it. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to Cassie's uh, original question of like, what to what do we see from Hatsi? And basically what, what I see is, is, you know, building off the idea of community, greater involvement, and sort of like crossover from the different um, outreach programs that we have that you're all able to participate in. You know, we have our after school programs in Santee, Winnebago and Macy, and it's not too much of a stretch to think that we can get it in uh, Walt Hill. Um, we have our summer program that is a week-long uh, summer academy here here on campus, and uh, then we have our scholars program, which is you know for you people, but um, for your age group. But the other ones are for you know K through 12 students. So basically, there's an opportunity to offer what you learned here to that younger generation, learn at the same time and just keep moving forward with it. So there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of, uh, I guess, synergies is good. <laughs> good <buzzword. laughs> Actually, some of you will be sitting at this table speaking with youth that are sitting out in the crowd and sharing your stories. That's, I mean, that's my hope. Is that you'll, you'll be in these seats and passing it on to the next generation and helping them yeah, 
I can't wait for the day that we have like a full circle thing happen where we have like one of our summer academy kids, like Rose Road race car kids, like oh, yeah. come through the scholars program and then like come to the other side of the table and like tell, you know, other people like, yo, I've been doing this for a long time. Let me tell you, these massive people know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone but Kate. He's a great philosopher. Oh, that's fun. Um, that well, we are at time, so um, let's thank our speakers at Fields Wishes. Yeah. <laughs>